we just want to give it a minute here. Okay, so I don't want everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, MSK Emory uh, lecture, e lecture series. Um, we today we have uh, Tatiana Gorbachova from Philadelphia, uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, she's kind enough to to come to 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 us today to talk to us about a uh, new nomenclature that has, has been introduced uh, recently by the uh, Society of Sculptural Radiology that, that became a white paper was published in the AJR journal. So we are so lucky to have her today. Uh, just before we introduce the speaker, um, we wanted to go over a few details about our lecture series. Um, again, just to remind everyone that this webinar is meant for educational purposes only, that all interactive features for attendees have been disabled to ensure optimal quality for all viewers. Uh, please um, email questions to Emory mskradiology at gmail.com. Sometimes we, we see people raising their hands and unfortunately we have disabled that feature uh, on this platform. So again, email any questions you may have to emory mskradiology at gmail.com. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, Tatiana has uh, agreed to give us about five to 10 minutes for a QA uh, session. Um, this video of this, this uh, presentation will be recorded and it will be made available within uh, probably two, three hours after the lecture is finished today. It will be uploaded uh, within the MSK YouTube channel, which is you can find by uh, searching uh, in YouTube for Emory MSK Radiology. Uh, attendees have not been given any permission to screen record any of these talks, which may contain material under copyright, unauthorized recording, use, distribution, and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. This webinar series is brought to you by the MSK Imaging Division at Emory University. Um, so the, um, just quickly here, uh, it, uh, Tatiana has a very extensive uh, resume. Uh, she's, she's a colleague, she's an active member of the uh, SSR Society. Um, I, I, before we started today, I was talking to her that one of the best lectures I've, I have witnessed uh, in my life, uh, in RSNA, it was a hand lecture given to by her uh, a few years ago. She's um, she's an incredible speaker. She, as you can see, she's well well accomplished. Uh, she did her uh, residency with uh, uh, up at UCSD, um, and you know that that uh, basically uh, speaks uh, of her volume and, and quality of as an MSK radiologist. Um, I won't say too much. I I, um, I think that. Uh, She's just a, a, an incredible a person and a great speaker. So we're very lucky to have Tatiana today. So Tatiana, if you want to start sharing your screen, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Felix, for a great introduction. Just to confirm, you can see my screen with the first slide, correct? Yes. Yes, can. awesome. Thank you very much for your kind words. Just one correction. I did my fellowship at UCSD and my residency at Drexel. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a pleasure. I welcome people who joined us virtually. And thank you um, to Emory faculty for putting together this series. This has been awesome. I've been logging into uh, your channel and listening to the talks. Uh, this is a great uh, endeavor and I congratulate you on this. Um, I'll do my best today. I'm going to talk about differential diagnosis and nomenclature of subchondral lesions. We're going to review the historic perspective and controversies regarding non-neoplastic subchondral lesions. We will describe various types. We're going to draw various lines and talk about the clinical implications. We will review current nomenclature, and uh, hopefully you're going to love it. And at the end, it's going to be intense lecture, but we will stand tall like that um, um, statue in Philadelphia. I don't have any relevant financial disclosures. 
I do have a disclosure that I will be shamelessly promoting a white paper on the nomenclature of subcondyl lesions that was commissioned by Society of Skeletal Radiology, where I had the privilege to be on a panel with outstanding co-authors, my sh uh, shout out to Felix right now, and Miriam Bridella was our panel chair. So this was fun and just great experience being on, on this panel. So how does one become interested in the nomenclature of anything, right? So many, many reasons for me. One of them is the frustration. You know how it works. Your internal medicine colleague, your technologist, your mother-in-law's friend asks you to look at this study because all the doctors are saying different things. And while you're loading, you hear the stories. They say you have a meniscal tear, you have a bad arthritis, a fracture, a dead bone. And one doctor just said you need a knee replacement. And uh, you know what you're going to see, something like this, right? They all are correct. And then you go explaining things. There is this stain, we used to call it song, but it's the fracture, but it's also necrosis and it ends bad. We're not supposed to call it song anymore. So let me write this down. And this conversation just repeats itself over and over. Um, it's not our fault, really, right? We just didn't have all the data in the past. The pathology and years of clinical MR observations, this was our first voyage, right? And now we really understand this magnificent creature. Well, forget the clinicians, right? They don't understand images like we radiologists do. But you show this case to a bunch of uh, bone radiologists, and you hear all sorts of descriptions. How do we communicate and how do we do research if we don't speak the same language? And then my final frustration is, what about the trainees? There is something about the way that we teach about OCD that confuses our trainees and makes them lose this natural ability to see difference between things. You, you have no problem seeing that these cars are very different despite they both cars, they both red cars with wheels, and that yet you show this fundamentally different MRs to your residents um, and maybe fellows. And I always sense this hesitation when they start taking the case, describing, I'm going to use the word, wrong words or something. And we start making mnemonics and lists and quizzes that are just not necessary at all. It would be so nice to give them clear understanding of things and a clear language to describe them. And lastly, once we compose this new family album of lookalike lesions, did we make another mistake? Did we oversimplify things and discarded their identities? Are we going on the next voyage of Sinbad? So SSR took initiative to clean up the mess. We separated the list of topics. And the first column is that toolbox of descriptive terms and the second is the diagnosis, the clinical pathologic entities. Today, we will review most of them, not every single one of them. I will be illustrating the descriptive terms and we will draw lines many, many times. So this is gonna be intense, please buckle up. This table will be popping up here and there, outlining controversies and the white paper recommendations and sometimes thing to, things to avoid. Let's start with the easy one. What's then an osteochondral lesion, an OCL? Well, we look at this case. There is something very wrong with both articular cartilage and subchondral bone. So we say it's the lesion, an osteochondral lesion, an OCL, or osteochondral lesion of the talus, OLT. That's what it is. The term of similar specificity emerged in the late 90s in the episode of Friends when Ross had this mysterious skin condition and the doctors could not figure out what it was. So Guru Saj, was his name, takes a look and confidently identifies it as a condus. That's what it is, it's a condus. So back to OCL, it's okay to say osteochondral lesion as long as you keep in mind that you essentially calling it an abnormality, a condus. It's okay to use it when you make an opening line in your dictation or in a clinical conversation, buying time to collect your thoughts on describing it further and hopefully giving it a better, more precise name. I personally think that OCL will always inhabit tailored dome lexicon 
in particular, because oftentimes those lesions are very old or very small and just no, no way to be any more specific. What is an OCD? And very importantly, D for defect or D for desiccants. If you think D for defect, you're talking about osteochondral defect, it's the morphologic term. It refers simply to focal defect in articular cartilage and subchondral bone. It's produced by multiple acute and chronic conditions. In acute setting, the fracture can create a defect, subchondral insufficiency fracture may collapse and create defect. A, um, osteonecrosis does the same, osteochondritis desiccans, that's the only way to abbreviate oste OCD um, can detach or even osteoarthritis when you have a large roo, uh, large cyst and it just roofs itself through attrition and creates a defect. So we should never abbreviate D for defect because it's not specific finding. It does not deserve an abbreviation. Just uh, leave it for desiccants. And when possible, try to state the etiology and chronicity of the defect that you are describing. OK, let's talk about death as it pertains to the bone. What does osteonecrosis look like? Well, a little side note, in all things MSK, frequently we talk about things being primary versus secondary because they may look and act quite differently. This is what I'm talking about. We have the primary osteoarthritis at the first CMC joint in this 59-year-old female, and uh, so typical distribution. And then you have 24-year-old male with atypical distribution on the second and fourth metacarpal and somebody who likes punch people and you have a secondary post-traumatic OA. Or you can have primary and secondary osteochondromatosis, right? Very frequent everyday secondary one coming from osteoarthritis and much more intriguing condition, primary one starting as a synovial metaplasia. Lipoma arborescens, secondary one, very common in inflammatory conditions. I frankly don't know what the primary looks like because I've never seen it, I believe. So osteonecrosis, it's very important to also differentiate primary versus secondary. So primary, there is a clear enemy line, a distinct demarcation between the living and the dead. And the secondary osteonecrosis is the messy battlefield where everything is intermixed. And the primary process such as trauma, infection, or wear and tear is trying to fix itself and heal, but it fails and dies as a result. So as long as we distinguish that, and now let's focus on the primary few points. So it's primary because the bone loses its blood supply and that's the first step. Infarcted area is composed of devitalized marrow that doesn't look any different from normal marrow on imaging. On pathology, they describe it as a zone of cell death. It's bone trabecular, they look very normal, and empty lacoons and uh, fat cells. They refer to it as a mummified fat. So we think about little kin tut living there in the zone of the dead. And then the margins, very important. It's the reactive interface between the dead and the living. And there are um, zones there. There is a creeping zone of substitution. That's a great name, right? It's the re uh, reactive vascularized granulation tissue. It's the reactive interface, right? Um, and then there is the next to it, there is a sclerotic oppositional new bones. And those two things next to each other, zone of substitution and oppositional new bone, create the double line sign on T2. Because it's the tissue separating itself, separating one area from the other, it gives you this uninterrupted rim surrounding the zone of osteonecrosis. So on imaging, the subchondral osteonecrosis consists of an area of preserved marrow signal outlined by a peripheral rim. It may involve marrow immediately subjacent to bone plate or less commonly, like this case, a distance from it. Again, rim is typically smooth, complete, and circles infarcted area without interruption. At one time, we were obsessing about concavity, convexity. Yes, it's typically undulating and concave to the articular surface. However, the shape of the line is not patognomonic. As you could see here, it's undulating, so you, could, you can pick different areas, convexity, concavity. And um, also note that the typical pattern of femoral head osteonecrosis is not preceded by 
bone marrow edema like signal. We'll come back to this. So why do things go bad? The dead bone is as strong and as viable bone, but what it lacks is the ability to remodel. So in the lone bones, the infarcts are inconsequential, but in the epiphysis, the bone eventually may start to break. Why? There are two components. Is one is the microfractures accumulate within the necrotic zone. That's one thing. And the second is that the focal concentration of stress at the junction between those thickened trabeculae, the oppositional new bone in the reparative zone and the necrotic trabecula. Before we see the collapse, we start seeing bone marrow edema-like signal around the infarct. Remember, it wasn't present before that collapse starts. And then we see actual collapse. We will talk about it closer to the end of the talk than we describe the features of that and specific criteria, so stay tuned. So once we collapse the dome, we just stomp on the king's tut grave and the marrow signal in the zone of infarct will no longer be preserved. So look at this bilateral hip osteonecrosis. Which hip is painful? Where is the osteonecrosis taking it to the next level? It's the one with the edema-like signal around it. Several studies concluding that most definitely by recently by Mayer and um, um, pretty much that the bone marrow edema surrounding osteonecrosis indicates epiphyseal collapse. The marrow fat in the infarct itself may be still, uh, still intact and the counter is maintained, but the diffuse surrounding bone marrow edema tells us there is a collapse happening, although you may not see it yet. But unlike um, this case, which is the next stage on the right hip, we not only have bone marrow edema-like signal, but also changes in the zone of the infarct itself. So no more mummified fat, we have the dark area. And the left hip here is going strong, preserved fat, no surrounding edema, uh, like signal, so no collapse. Um, what kind of fractures are there morphology-wise? What is there to break to begin with? So when we look at this bone cartilage sandwich, we recognize this dark line, which is subchondral bone plate, is the combination of the deepest calcified cartilage layer. You can only separate them from the subchondral bone plate on ultra short T's and clinical images, we see them as one dark band. And in, for this talk, we are mostly interested in this structure, the subchondral bone plate. So subchondral fracture, when the fracture is a line or a band of low signal intensity at a small distance from the bone plate. The line represents fractured bone trabecula with variable amount of fracture callus and granulation tissue depending on the chronicity. And uh, that's not like a reactive interface we just talked about. The fracture line, it's irregular, often discontinuous and open-ended. It's parallel or convex but sometimes it also may be concave to the articular surface. It typically does not delineate large areas of marrow and typically it runs through the bone marrow edema-like signal. And then osteochondral fractures. Then uh, the fracture involves the articular cartilage and subchondral bone plate. It be two patterns. It can go through the uh, plate and cartilage completely or incompletely encircling a portion of subchondral bone or manifest as a counter deformity with bone plate depression. Let's illustrate the various bone injuries in the setting of ACL tear, our beloved pattern, ACL fails, um, pops, tibia uh, translates, and you have this telltale lesions on the condyla and the uh, uh, tibial side, tear of the ACL, and our beloved the deep sulcus radiographically and the injuries on the tibia. So, these injuries can be um, manifesting as a spectrum, um, depending on the severity. So here there is no counter deformity, but there is a fracture line, which does not involve the bone plate, that's a subchondral fracture. Then osteochondral fracture then actually violates the bone uh, plate, separating the fragment. Or when you see a counter deformity and the fractures of the subchondral bone plate. If you don't see deformity and you don't see fracture line, whatever modalities and uh, you're using to diagnose those fractures, but if you don't diagnose 
a fracture, just bone marrow edema like pattern, you call it the bone contusion. So everything can be present in one setting. So when we talk about acute traumatic lesions, we're just going to get rid of the clutter. Are the beloved terms that blend in fracture and non-fracture terms together? Um, it's either contusion or some type of a fracture, subchondral, osteochondral. Just commit to one of the three. There is a pushback from orthopedists for ACL setting. They say maybe those are fractures anatomically, but they don't like us to report them as fractures. It just sounds too scary. Call them something else. Call them trabecular impaction, articular impaction, contusions, bruises, uh, trabecular microfractures. Just don't use the F word. Um, how do we respond to that? When in doubt, I say, we err on the side of the truth. <laughs> we stand behind those definitions because they can be applied universally to all the joints and all the fractures in the knee, in the hip. So why soften the blow for the ACL cases in particular? Let's speak about that young population a little bit more extensive. There is this unicorn in osteochondral lesions affecting the young. Osteochondritis desiccans, named by Koenig in 1887 and spectacularly reviewed by Barry um, in uh, his uh, Centennial Review. Highly recommend this article. It's very entertaining, powerful reading, guaranteed to give goosebumps to musculoskeletal radiologists. So in 1887, Koenig published a paper studying why young people get loose bodies. He proposed three mechanisms. Number one is severe trauma that breaks of parts of the joint surface, or lesser trauma that may cause contusions and produce areas of necrosis, which may separate. And then the third one, some spontaneous cause of separation when minimal trauma acts on the pre-existing underlying lesion. So Koenig's paper would have caused little stir if he hadn't offered the term osteochondritis dissecans, dissecans as to dissect, to separate. Well, as Barry writes, two things soon became apparent. First, recognition even by Koenig that the name was inappropriate. And the second, that he launched a phrase that would be taken to the heart of medical profession and resist all attempts to dislodge it. An attempt by Oxhausen to replace this with the word, um, that, that one, was doomed from the start. So, Barry himself contributed to the development of this thesis that condition results from abnormal and the chondral ossification of the epiphysis. This is Barry's illustration. He says that the proof comes from the structure of this loose body in OCD. They bear benchmarks of their origin. The main benchmark is the hypertrophy of the cartilage that fill in the crater. And uh, it's taken when, the, when it's dislodged with a short strip of the surrounding cartilage of normal sickness. And charming statement, he says, it gives it the shape of a whale, which is not uncommon. He concludes that it's far to say that the Koenig classification has passed the test of time with flying colors. Osteochondritis desiccans is an ossification defect, and we're still ignorant about the cause of this defect. Well, we're not that ignorant anymore. The current hypothesis is that juvenile OCD is produced by disruption of the endochondral ossification of the epiphysis. It wasn't reduced in early studies by Barry and was further developed in more recent work based on MR observation by Tal Laor and uh, colleagues. So here's the primary physis, it's linear in shape, it's responsible for elongation of the bone, and he is the secondary physis, spherical, responsible for circumferential growth and ossification of the epiphysis. So growth proceeds from the chondra osseous border, then the cartilage essentially is turning into bone and the epiphysis enlarges and the, the cartilage overlying gets thinner and thinner. So that's a normal situation. Blood supply is vital to this process. So in OCD, D for desiccants, that's the only way we abbreviate, an unknown insult causes disturbance in the small area of secondary physis which results in localized delay or cessation of normal ossification. So epiphyseal segment 
in the area of disturbance remains cartilaginous, while the rest of the epiphysis continues to ossify and expand in the centrifugal fashion, creating an appearance of the radiolucent crater. It's not a full defect, it's filled with cartilage, but radiographically it does look like a crater. And that area corresponds to the area of a stalled cartilage ossification. So this segment, a progeny, may later develop deep laminar calcifications. It may go on to ossify partially or completely. It may heal without any sequela. But when the lesion cannot withstand forces applied to the joint surface, it may begin to separate from the parent bone and become an unstable OCD. And it's fun to see those remnants in the lesions that were healed, the classic locations, and uh, it's kind of tragic to see when they didn't heal. Um, when comparing the young people with osteochondral lesions, um, acute traumatic contra osteochondral lesion versus OCD, we can see that acute injuries are caused by outside in mechanism when external force disrupts the articular surface. In OCD, the detachment first starts at the deep basal portion of the lesion, producing a cleft at the interface, leading to fragment instability, disruption of the bone plate, and overland cartilage after that, and eventual fragment separation. So radiographically, if you think about that mechanism, the difference are even more profound. In acute fractures, the injured bone developed here, developed um, with the, in sync with the rest of the articular cartilage. So those fractures may be quite subtle or completely inconspicuous, such as this case. You, you can't even see that because the bone mineralized the same in, in sync. But um, in osteochondritis desiccans, the fragment was abnormally mineralized from the very beginning, so they're nothing alike. Another analogy is like a groundwater ruining the pavement. It becomes unstable deep underneath and then breaks off, like in this 18-year-old patient with chronic unstable OCD lesion that just manifested one time when he heard a pop getting out of the bed and was not able to extend his knee. See, it's stuck in flexion, even in the MR scanner. So this is how we analyze and report osteochondritis desiccans. First, is this a normal variant or is the osteochondritis desiccans? Okay. Um, once we determine that that's a desiccans, we're gonna determine is patient skeletally mature, number one, and after that, is fragment stable. Once we think it's unstable, we try to push it further. Is it going to be salvageable or not? We're not going to go into those details right now. Okay, story time. Once upon the time, there was a painful knee that did not have a name, so it called itself a peculiar clinical pathologic entity until Sven Allbach recognized it picked it up from the crowd and gave it a name, spontaneous osteonecrosis of the knee. If you read his original 1968 paper, all 29 pages of it, that generated a misnomer that became entrenched into medical lexicon for decades. It reads incredibly, incredibly strong and scientifically sound. I just could not help smiling because at times it reads that if he's trying to answer the criticism from our generation by separating the facts from interpretations and beliefs, he recognized the beast. He described it extremely accurately. He gave it a temporary name that he knew was not perfect. So this is my clinical case, but it looks just like the one in the article. Um, patients over 60 year old, no trauma, they described a sudden memorable onset of, severe, onset of severe unrelated pain. They could tell not only the day, but exact moment in activity and then the pain started. So Olbach described all the features, the flattening, the radiolucency, sometimes what he referred to as a calcified plate and sclerotic halo. He mapped out typical location of the lesion. He also mentioned that simultaneously tibia may be affected. He described the spectrum of the outcome. 
uh, from spontaneous healing to end stage arthritis that required joint replacement. He even described that um, in half of the knees that underwent arthrotomy, remember this is 1968, um, half of those cases had meniscal tears and all of the menisci were torn radially. He was also arguing the corticosteroid may not be rational. He said that it's different from primary way because the condition originates in the bone, not the cartilage. He looked at the biopsy and said that, look, there is a repair bone tissue and some few necrotic trabecula trapped in a you know, fibrous tissue. He states that he was unable to identify marked presence of that bone by histology and rather lively synthesis of bone was a constant finding. Oh my God, this is all true. So where did he go wrong? My theory is, um, I blame him on his two pathologists whom he thanks for advice in interpretation of biopsy histology. They did not make it to the author list. The conversation probably was like that. What's up with this live bone, a necrotic bone? And they were like, don't worry, that's just a creeping zone of substitution. We see it in the infarcts all the time. So. I don't know, really. Um, Albach believes that the condition is the manifestation of osteonecrosis, but he based this belief on exclusion of other possible entities. Just too quick, he was to dismiss a fracture because he thought fractures, um, like a classic Schatzker type fractures occurring in this age group, he did not recognize that subchondral fractures may occur without major trauma. He was searching for the word to go together with this osteonecrosis. And the word is secondary, not spontaneous. But what's done, it's done. The entity got its name. Immediately, Sank was like an adopted child in the osteonecrosis family. Didn't look like anybody, anybody else. Patients did not have typical risk factors. In fact, nothing about it matched classic osteonecrosis. So when MR emerged, we saw that they could not be even more diff any more different, right? And until landmark, landmark paper by Yamamoto and co-investigators, they just finished, finished looking at the hip AVN, recognizing that lots of those were in fact fractures. So they turned their attention to the knee. They looked at 14 cases of song that went to surgery and they recognized it for what it was, a primary fracture with a mixture of reparative response and secondary AVN and a nice title that sort of reflects the essence of the paper. It all makes sense. Once one forceful step or long fundraising walk plus meniscal tear and pre-existing cartilage loss and the stress of the, on the bone just becomes unbearable. And you develop different morphologies of the fracture. I will talk about those lines in a, in a few minutes. It's the poster child, meniscal tear, cartilage loss, and subchondral fracture. Just brief side talk, speaking of meniscal tear and meniscectomies. You know, typical reading room conversation. Look at this tear. Can you find the fragment? Yes, remember, um, go more peripherally, find it hanging in the gutter. Good job next case and then this case come back comes back after a surgery and bam this is so bad it feels like i'm an accomplice in the crime so we call the fragments and, and meniscal tears and once the the fragment is taken down and meniscus is the shape to still a stable base some meniscus don't have a stable base left anymore um but let's get back to our story right so the lost child has finally joined biologic family. Meet your brothers. The Sif of the hip also had major identity crisis, still undergoing some soul searching, and the youngsters, the tailors, the metatarsal. So your real name is Sif, subchondral insufficiency fracture. Um, can I still be called Song? All my friends call me Song. Yes, you can, in fact, will be calling you song for decades. And you guys remember like for a while we would get phone calls in the reading room. You mentioned insufficiency fracture in your report. Is it like a fracture fracture or a song kind of thing? And we would almost whisper, yeah, it's, it's a song. Right. So 
this was very sterile table from our part. A classic controversial topic was our least controversial. It's an old misnomer, don't use it, we should all move on. Is this happy end? Not really. Someone gets up and spoils the movie, asking uncomfortable questions. So if it's all the same, everything is safe, subchondral insufficiency fracture, one disease for all, do we know why some do much worse than the others? And are they really the same? And look, this, this elderly lady um, who developed severe acute onset of hip pain after dancing in her grandson's wedding. And you see a bone marrow edema pattern and you do see a fracture, so definitely SIF. How about, is this the same as this healthy construction worker with gradual onset of hip pain, now ambulating with a cane? He had normal radiographs, but tons of bone marrow like signal on MR. We used to call it transient bone marrow edema syndrome. Shall we stop calling it? Because this dude clearly has a fracture, right? Is it just SIF, no more? How about this case? Also, young male, gradual onset of pain, positive radiographs, he has the osteoporosis of the hip, could not find a fracture. Maybe it just were not good enough. Maybe our resolution was not enough. When we have clinical seven Tesla magnets, everybody's going to have a fracture. So do we call it TOH? Do we call it transient bone marrow edema or just the SIF? So by the way, how often we see fractures in the, what we call transient bone marrow edema-like uh, uh, syndrome, uh, the frequency varies uh, from 4% to 50%. Four is too low. It comes from earlier papers and you see the, uh, there was no high resolution images. So it's 50%, it's probably even higher than that. Um, but in my opinion, it's not 100%. So this is the topic we had the most animated debate, is the condition manifesting as a marrow edema-like signal and regional osteopenia on radiographs. So what is the preferred terminology, considering that there is a temporal relationship between the MRI and X-ray findings? Um, and number two is, are SIF and TOH separate entities or the one? So we concluded that TOH, transient osteoporosis of the hip, is the preferred term for this entity in presence of radiographic findings. Why? Well, both terms, TOH and transient bone marrow edema uh, syndrome, um, they accurately describe this entity on the different imaging modalities in the various stages of the process. However, we believe that the term osteoporosis in the title, TOH, implies that the bone is weakened and the patient is at at risk, um, increased risk for SIF if they do not restrict the weight bearing. So when you don't have radiographs or they're normal, then you can use transient bone marrow edema-like syndrome. And the second step to pick up subchondral insufficiency fracture that may coexist or result from that syndrome. So your dictation would be like it's a TOH with a SIF. So then you should spend all your effort actually finding that fracture. Uh, one more cute finding is uh, what's with that so-called medial sparing? It's the characteristic sparing of the medial head and the trochanters. A large article looking at 155 cases, they say it's very common in the transient osteoporosis of the hip. You typically see it in earlier lesions when we image them soon after the um, symptoms onset. And they typically, that this marrow sparing disappears, it becomes more uniform signal changes after seven weeks. So the authors speculate that this is something to do with the trabecular arrangement, preventing the spread of edema initially, and later on, it just soaks up the entire femoral head. On a personal note, I remember as a resident, um, I was looking at the papers and reading the description, saying, no, that severe osteoporosis with vanishing femoral head contour, marked refraction of the trabecular subchondral bone. I honestly did not see it. And I thought, what are they smoking? So after seeing those in real life, retrospectively and prospectively, this is my best way to explain it, the look to the trainees. So here's the normal patient. And this is the osteopenic patient. 
the cortices are thinned, the trabecula became more vivid because there is a less trabecula in the background, but all the bones are involved. So in the transient osteoporosis of the hip, all of a sudden, as the hip becomes see-through, the acetabulum is seen in greater details because the femoral cortical line has disappeared. It can be technical. Technical issues, do, they will affect entire film, not selectively blurring the femoral head. So try to, to use that scene through the hip. And one day when you guys read films for money, you will make us all proud figuring out the impossible case of bilateral uh, osteoporosis of the hip because they all behave the same way, disappear in femoral head. So back to the, that question, can we predict poor clinical outcomes in uh, subchondral insufficiency fractures? How can we tell who with invisible uh, radiographically only visible on MRI fractures will progress to something like this? Well, there are two approaches taken in the literature on how to carve out the unknown and <laughs> reveal the truth. One approach was use MRI histopathologic correlation. Initially, this was a quest to learn about avascular necrosis, osteonecrosis, and as a result, learning about insufficiency fractures. So leave it to Japanese orthopedic surgeons and pathologists to produce some spectacular work on the topic. Another approach taken largely by the Europeans was to provide detailed analysis focused on MRI features, looking at all the subtleties, leave it to Bruno Vanderberg and colleagues to determine which features on MR will predict irreversibility and poor prognosis. And in recent year, um, Yamamoto's crew sort of cut through and joined them on this side. So classic paper by Vanderberg and Lekovay looked into subchondral changes in the knee and in the hip, trying to differentiate between early irreversible lesions from lesions that resolve um, with conservative treatment. They looked at everything, the edema, the black line, the black area, and the content deformity. So you see only descriptive features without getting to the, um, the, the histopathologic causes yet. So they determined that the only two things that really matter as a predictors is the black area, this one, not the line, and the presence of counter deformity. They said that if that black area is thick and long, these are poor prognostic criteria. So this is an illustration. We don't see contour deformity, just the line and tons of bone marrow edema like signum. This completely resolve, uh, resolved. As opposed to this one, you have this uh, uh, black area, subchondral, really thick, really long, more than four um, millimeters. And in one year, patient progressed to this on MR and radiographically, she progressed to that. Many investigators, on that same topic did not separate the line and the area. They refer to them collectively as the band. And in my opinion, that, that muddied the waters. Um, and some of those uh, is, images, they clearly lack the resolution to even tell them apart. So the, um, the results were not exactly reproduced. But one interesting finding that emerged that inadequate acetabular coverage can contribute to the irreversibility. And also to some degree, the, the, the larger the area of fracture, the worse prognosis is. And its relationship to the weight bearing portion of the femoral head also gonna be important. That's kind of intuitive. This is that further step along the line, separating a uh, sif of the hip in two categories. There is a central type and the lateral type. Uh, it, it reveals the positional relationship between the fracture and the degree of acetabular coverage. So you see the hips with a, with a lack of acetabular coverage, you could see how the fracture just happens at the contact um, that uh, speculated because of the stress between the acetabular edge and lateral portion of the femoral head. So they uh, um, revealed that the lateral type of lesions tend to do worse. So this is what uh, the paper where the MR histopathologic approach 
met the MRI predictors approach, Synodus paper from 2016, they classified CIF of the femoral head into three types based on the intensity of the subchondral bone above the low signal intensity band. So here's the band and I looked at this, the small, small area and uh, see what's the signal gonna be. So type what if it can be as bright, it can be heterogeneous or dark. So when it's uh, bright on both sides, histologically, this was a fracture line running through the edema on histology. Heterogeneous stood for a mixture of things. And type three, when it's all dark, um, making it look like a thickened area, histologically was a necrosis. And this type three CIF did not recover with conservative treatment. And this is where they united with the classic Van der Berg's paper, this is that subchondral area, and confirmed the, his descriptions and predictions. In the knee, same little problem that will lump the line and the area occasionally. Um, a recent study by Platt looked at the risk of clinical progression. They measured the width and the length um, without distinguishing line or the area. Um, and another reason they probably did not reproduce the, uh, the, some of the uh, conclusions is because the population was not early. There was significant pre-existing cartilage loss and uh, another factors come into play in that scenario. So this classic criteria applied to the early lesions without significant osteoarthritis. But these studies and also a shout out to the Emory and the Jefferson group that they revealed additional numerous clinical and morphologic parameters, um, such as extent of cartilage loss, meniscal damage is the poor predictor, loss of knee range of motion at the time of presentation. What didn't matter is again, how much bone marrow edema pattern is present. And uh, again, some of the lesion parameters, but I think the problem is uh, comes in part at least from lumping together. We talked about fractures. What about collapse? What does it mean? And this is not some poetic term. It has a definition. Collapse, epiphyseal collapse or articular collapse, those are synonyms. It's the fracture of subchondral plate in a traumatic setting. It can be depicted by two patterns. One is the deformity of the subchondral bone plate resulting in the loss of the normal epiphyseal sphericity. Sometimes, it's very subtle flattening, like a deflated football, or not so subtle and very abrupt focal depression in a traumatic setting, we would call it a collapse. Or another feature is fluid-filled cleft underlying subchondral bone plate, representing fracture cleft. And these patterns may be present individually, but they often coexist. This is our beloved crescent sign on radiographs. What's important is collapse manifested by one or the other or both of it. It's the irreversible pivotal point in clinical um, uh, presentation. We see in this case before, remember osteonecrosis with collapse and loss of normal fat. The zoomed in images reveal multiple features in the same patient. Okay, this is the fluid filled cleft over here. It's not as common in the osteonecrosis with typical on the MRI, we see contra deformities more commonly uh, flattened or focal depression seen in both hips at the various areas. So that was osteonecrosis. This is a subchondral insufficiency fracture also with the collapse. How do we know? Here's the contra deformity and here's the cleft. You can sometimes see the cleft underneath the subchondral insufficiency fractures as well. These are features of collapse. Look, the hips are back, right? Um, one little tricky part about collapse is osteonecrosis, which I think deserves a little bit of review, is how the cleft runs. Most suitable title would be stop, collapse, stop, but we're gonna with the run collapse. So it usually happens, I should say it always happens in the necrotic zone and usually starts at the lateral boundary of osteonecrosis. These um, areas of uh, collapse form elongated clusters and it propagates um, in the smaller lesions through the subchondral region. 
and that's most common pattern. But in the large lesion, sometimes you see it's going through the deep necrotic region, often at the necrosis viable bone interface. So definitely look underneath. That's the most common uh, place and then under subchondral bone plate. But it can also happen quite deep in the lesion. So here's the example of large size uh, osteonecrosis, and here's the collapse running through the deep portion of the lesion. By the way, CT um, maybe uh, is better at displaying counter deformities, step off, and things like that because of the higher spatial resolution of CT. And interestingly, the Japanese type uh, C2, which would be this one, extensive zone of osteonecrosis involving more, more than two thirds weight bearing areas, they by definition have a very high collapse rate as showed in this recent paper from 2019. Even if you don't see collapse in the lesion like this, you do see it here, they have almost 60% rate of collapse in two years and almost 85 in five years. So that may dictate that this should be addressed with the joint preservation surgery sooner, uh, even with this, even as people are asymptomatic. So this is something to be looked into. So final slides, we're gonna bring this talk together with one more descriptive terms. We've seen it, subchondral hypointense area. You could see this hype, uh, just more for, um, visually subchondral hypointense area in three situations. One in the subchondral insufficiency fracture. Look here, there is the fracture here, but then it close three, uh, goes really close to the subchondral bone plate. You, can't, you cannot separate it anymore, right? It becomes one thickened area. It produces apparent crescentic thickening of the plate. Note that Yet here, there is a normal counter and normal cartilage. Histologically, just to repeat, this is a combination of fracture line directly beneath subchondral plate, some granulation tissue, and oftentimes secondary osteonecrosis between the fracture and the plate. Remember Sonoda's paper. Then uh, another situation, you can have this area in a collapse you create this apparent thickening of the bone plate from impacted trabecular, again, granulation tissue and secondary osteonecrosis. So you will have some counter deformity there. And the third one, quite trivial, you could see those dark areas in uh, subchondral sclerosis or eburnation in setting of uh, osteoarthritis. Histologically, um, by the way, how do you tell? Well, there is no cartilage, right? That's completely gone, right? Histologically, um, this is related to deposition of a new bone on pre-existing trabecula, the sclerotic appearance, and some trabecular microfractures just from having no cartilage there with callus. And also there is so-called shallow secondary osteonecrosis there. So this descriptor, of subchondral hypointense area, it's the purely descriptive term. It does not carry any diagnosis, but it indicates conditions that frequently have a secondary osteonecrosis. So now we arrived at the subchondral insufficiency fracture that's gonna tie up this whole lecture. It has two manifestation, a, a manifestation is a fracture line at the small distance from subchondral bone plate, or when it goes really close to the surface, a subchondral hypointense area. It can be uh, an entity in isolation, but it can be a component of other diagnoses, such as transient osteoporosis of the hip, you know, avascular or osteonecrosis or osteoarthritis, meniscal tears. Um, so we should strive to find that other entity, but that may not always possible. And we try to um, detect, detect the presence and extent of specific morphologic findings in that sieve. You know, fracture line, area, how big, uh, where exactly in terms of weight bearing surface, is there collapse on top of it? And what's the cartilage loss uh, looking like? Because these tend to be the predictors much very easy when you see the collapse that's it, it's at the irreversible stage so we should evaluate to determine the prognosis and that's the end of my talk thank you guys so much
And if you have any questions, I will do my best answering them. Liana, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal, phenomenal uh, lecture. Uh, we, we had a, a couple of questions uh, that, uh, that came in. Um, your lecture was so detailed that, um, you know, simplicity speaks by itself. So uh, the best talks, we, we have the least questions is because, you know, everything is so clear that. But uh, a couple of questions came in. Um, can you, what the, the first question is, can you um, spend a little more time about the significance of the um, signal intensity uh, paralleling the uh, subchondral fracture? There was a slide, I think, that this is, this is probably the, the asking. There was, a, there was a slide that you show the difference in sin intensity and the uh, pronostication of that uh, sin intensity being bright uh, on one end of the spectrum and being dark on the other mm -hmm. end of the spectrum. And the question asks specifically if, do you think that we should be um, specifically addressing that in a report saying, you know, this is a, a subchondral fracture, uh, detailing the strength of the fracture uh, involvement along the femoral head, how much of the articular surface is involved. But do you think the question is, do you think that we should say, well, the in the sin intensity being bright in the areas of kind of fracture carries a, a better uh, pronostic, uh, pronostic uh, 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 you know, factor. Do you think that we should be say something about pronostication based on that? Um, this is an excellent, excellent question. I appreciate this is the, the essence of this talk. I believe this is the slide you refer, they, they might be referring to, right? Is that, is that yeah, it? That's it yeah. Right. Yes. So, um, um, few things to, you should develop the, the lexicon, and the communication with your referring physician. So we cannot be speaking to ourselves in our report. So before we launched into, you know, applying those recommendations, just get together with the orthopedics so you know what they hear when you say things and uh, you, it, this is, these are the guidelines, right? So they need to be applied to clinical context. But what I feel uh, strongly about that, you know, there is enough evidence that when the line is really close to the articular surface, when it's thick and extensive, and there are certain criteria for that, that may preclude, um, that may indicate, and there is evidence for that, um, uh, irreversibility. But does that mean get out and replace the hip? Um, there, are, there are many things that factor into that decision. I would, if it's extensive and thick and there, uh, you, know, you can comment on that, this is something that I think people can decide how much evidence they need to present in the individual clinical report in, you know, in a stack of 50 in a day. What I feel strongly is when you see the collapse and we pretty clear about that, you know, flattening, clefts, um, not just the line and edema-like signal, state collapse, at least strive to do that because this is a clear evidence of irreversibility. Um, for example, in this case, we do see subchondral area, but also look like there is a, less of, a lack of normal sphericity of the hip. And I would definitely confirm in the other plane, but just looking at this image, this is a collapsed hip and we already arrived at that pivotal moment of irreversibility. So what should you be saying in the earlier stages? State the fracture and state lack of collapse if you don't see evidence of that. And I think this is as detailed as you need to be. I would not probably go into describing the signal heterogeneity. It's just, uh, I think it, we, we get too full of ourselves if we go in too much of the signal in the, at least in the impression. So call collapse and try to determine where the fracture is with respect to the articular surface and extent of it and talk to your orthopedist so you you guys understand and communicate. I hope that answers the question. It did, uh, thank you so much. Uh, the other question was uh, with respect to the, you know, using the word insufficiency fracture in the setting of a young patient. Uh, so the, the question basically, which sometimes come, uh, confuses fellows, right? People in training, um, they see someone with a, for example, Taylor head fracture, and when you, when we say, well, let's, let's, you know, in the impression, let's uh, summarize it and, and, and we say subconscious sufficiency fracture, they become confused. So, <laughs> so can you, you know, I, um, can you make a reference to when do you commit to call something insufficiency fracture uh, 
and when do you commit to speak? And especially in the, in the young setting, right? In the 20 year old or even early 30, uh, when do you commit to say fatigue fracture? When do you commit to say self, uh, self-conduct, self-conduct, fracture, anywhere in the body, being the talus, in the calcaneus, uh, whatever the case mm-hmm. may be. Okay, so that's another very, it's an excellent question. I appreciate that. Um, just to say, if you're too scared, if you're in doubt, just call it stress fracture because <laughs> it will be applicable to both insufficiency and fatigue, right? Just the easy way out. But that does not answer your question, actually, right? Well, the question is, do we know if this is a normal stress to an abnormal bone, which would make it an insufficiency fracture, or is this an extra stress, uh, you know, supra physiologic stress to a normal bone? Sometimes, even in a young person, it, it's difficult to determine. So classically, you think young person, normal bone, too much stress, you're going to call it a stress fracture, right? But this patient with the transient osteoporosis of the hip, the the bone is no longer normal, right? Remember this guy with transient osteoporosis, that's why we brought up the term, so to, to indicate that it's weakened. So in this situation, although they're young, we sort of speculate here and we know for sure here that the bone is abnormal. So the proper term would be subchondral insufficiency, right? So this should be your guiding principle. Is this bone being altered in any way? Um, so if it's a healthy athlete, um, you know, doing those crazy athletic things, then it's going to be fatigue fracture or more commonly called stress fracture, but stress usually applies to all of it. Or is this something that altered the bone from age-related osteoporosis or this regional osteoporosis, then it's going to be an insufficiency fracture. But um, this this is what you, this is the, my thought process and I hope it answers your question. Yes. Uh... A couple more questions and uh, we'll be done. Um, I think the one question came in uh, asking, could some of these be explained by acuity or chronicity? Do you think this is a, an acute and chronic process? Uh, do you think it's an acute process? Or is there any, any reference in the literature to speak of um, chronicity in the setting? On of- which entity? I'm so sorry. Which one uh, are you? Uh, I'm assuming they, they meant to say some kind of fracture of the knee, uh, insufficiency of the knee. All right. Uh, on the knee, yes. um, I, I was going. I was getting ready with the hip. It's so um, the hip, but, they, they didn't specify. I'm assuming it's a the knee, but you can. Right, use, right. You can use um, so just um, I'll, I'll attempt to answer for both. So for the hip, that the largest uh, you know um, article from the the Greek investigators, then they looked at 155 hips. Um, those these are the ones they reported 50 percent of fracture. Although we do think it's probably higher but they say there was no association with the duration of symptoms. Remember how we said um, that medial sparing, that's the reflection of chronicity, the edema progresses and engulfs, but they did not see the same relationship with the presence of the fracture, specifically in the constant of transient osteoporosis of the hip. I don't wanna extrapolate on all of the insufficiency fractures right now. Um, I think it's it would be logical to think about that, you know, the more extensive fracture it is, when it you know it progresses to collapse, you it's sort of tempting to speculate these are more chronic, but it may be also a reflection of the underlying bone condition and whether the patient was protecting weight better or not. So I think so far. At least I can't think of um, good evidence to indicate chronicity, in particular in the hip, the literature state that there is no clear um, association between the, uh, you know, the appearance of the fracture and the duration of symptoms. Perfect. Uh, one last question that, that I have here is, um, you know, in, in your daily evaluation of this condition um, in your clinic, when, how do you decide, sometimes, uh, I think this is a question what they're trying to ask, how do you differentiate uh, a setting of, you know, some kind of sufficiency fracture being the hip or the knee, or even transient osteoporosis of the hip in the setting of uh, synovitis and the joint infusion, how do you differentiate that from a, uh, an infection, right? Being, uh, being a monoarticular process. Do you put infection, your differential diagnosis all, all the time? Do you go by history? especially in the cases like where you don't have that much extensive edema extending beyond the epiphyseal uh, region. Um, the question is asking like, how do you also include infection 
uh, as, a, as a possible diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to go to that slide. Interestingly, these are the slides that I threw out because for the time's sake, and um, I don't think I have it. We want you to show everything you had, uh, Tatiana. <laughs> right. So um, it's an it's an excellent question. So two components to the answer. Number one is just remember that subchondral insufficiency fracture, as we stated here, can be a an associated findings or complication of other conditions, and it certainly you know can be component of us. Um, uh, rapid idiopathic inflammatory arthritis, you know, the, the so-called um, rapidly destructive osteoarthritis, we used to call it, this is one, so this is also something we discussed in the white paper that you could see that fracture, but you can also see it in setting of septic hip. So seeing the fracture itself does not help you determine whether it's septic or not. It's the other features. So for example, here, we see that there is a clear sparring of the acetabular side. So you operate with the usual findings of something with some, uh, something you would think of a being septic or not. Just forget the fracture line for a second. It just doesn't help. You can complicate anything with the subchondral fracture. So you operate with the rest of it. Is this sparring the one of the articular sides, um, you know, like in this case, or it's both sides of the joint? The, the bone marrow edema like pattern in the transient osteoporosis tends to be more extensive. It just paints the entire hip and spares acetabulum. Yes, there is typically an effusion, but septic hips would give you more periarticular soft tissue swelling and the edema sort of respects the, um, the periarticular areas, uh, involves them. It's not as extensive and asymmetric, but we all know when in doubt, septic hip is too severe of disease to miss. So I would not recommend aspiration in a case like this, then it's clearly fitting the clinical and MRI picture, but anything can be complicated with septic, right? I don't think it's the common scenario in subchondral insufficiency fractures, but if you see bone marrow edema-like signal on both sides of the joint, extensive synovitis, periarticular swelling, muscle edema, God forbid, abscesses, then maybe you still have a subchondral insufficiency fracture, but you gotta aspirate the joint. But I wanna warn you guys, the last little caveat is, you know, putting a stamp on every single case cannot rule out septic joint because you just lose the credibility. So this is my thought process, um, you know, seeing the classic examples like this, when there is no reason to suggest septic arthritis, on the imaging and hopefully not clinically. But if there's a clinical concern and imaging follows that, you just have to ask for it. Perfect. Well, that concludes all the questions. Tatiana, again, thank you so much for thank you. <laughs> being so generous. This is an amazing uh, talk. It will uh, be recorded and, and saved within the uh, MSK Emory YouTube channel. Uh, so everyone just look look out for, for the lecture. It will be available in the next uh, hour or so. So one more time, thank you. Everyone stay safe uh, and thank you again. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you for sticking to the rest of the talk. I appreciate it. Thank it you. Great. Bye bye.